I'd like to introduce our first speaker, and it's the person you may have had uh, to uh, a chance to meet yesterday. Uh, for those who haven't, this is Chandler Caruth, and Chandler leads the C++ platform team and LLVM team at Google, and is a fan of single malt whiskey and Cherry Coke Zero, but provided they are served separately. And Chandler's talk today is especially relevant to those who do not understand compiler optimization. And I know this for fact because the title of the talk is Understanding Compiler Optimization. Chandler Caruth. All right. So our folks warming up, waking up a little bit, a little bit. All right, so, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you today about compiler optimization. Um, how many folks here write C++ code? I know there's some people who write Java, enough of you write C++ code. So, so a big question for me is why are you writing C++? Uh, how many folks here are writing C++ because it is the easiest programming language they know? <laughs> look around you, look around you, it has your hand up. Those people are liars. Okay, how many folks here are writing C++ because they care a lot about the performance of their code? Uh, these, this is the right reason to use C++. But there's a real challenge when you're trying to work on performance of your code, and that's that when you write C++ code, a very large factor in the performance of your program is the compiler, how the compiler optimizes that code. And, and I worry about this because you're writing C++, caring about the performance, but most people don't necessarily understand how compiler optimizers work. And, and it's very hard to effectively make high performance code if you don't understand a critical component in the code's performance. So this talk's whole mission, the whole purpose that I have in giving this talk is to try and teach you all kind of how the compiler's optimizer works, how it interprets your code, give you a mental model for kind of reasoning about performance in that way. Um, and so, so this, this talk is going to feature lots of code. It's going to feature lots of compiler internals. I'm going to try and walk you through it. It's essentially, you know, uh, like three weeks of a compiler's course compressed into an hour and 15 minutes, uh, which may be a little bit bold. So let, let's get into it and see how we do. So many folks here have taken a compiler's course, right? A few people have taken compiler's courses. Not very many. Anyone use this book? So this book is, is the book I had in my compilers course. It taught me a lot about, uh, uh, about parsers and parser generators. Uh, it taught me a lot about code generation and register allocation, and it taught me very little about actual compilers. Um, and, and we need to understand why. So the first thing to realize is that this, this book uh, has on its cover this dragon character up here, right? And the dragon character is, is labeled the complexity of compiler design, all right? And then it has a bunch of, of, of tools that this knight here is theoretically going to use to tackle this complexity. And a big component of, of this book is the idea of parser generators allowing you to tackle the complexity of compiler design. Because most of this book's complexity focuses on parsing and the complexity of parsing. Now, that's actually not the side of compilers I find to be terribly complex. That's not the side of compilers I'm going to talk about today. And, and, and the other problem I have with this book is that this dragon seems awfully friendly. I mean, I, are you afraid of this? Like, I mean, come on, he's, he's, he's practically smiling. I mean, this is a very, like, cute dragon. See, when I think of compilers and the complexity that they face, I think much more of this dragon. Uh, which is a bit more scary, a bit, you know, more fire coming out of its mouth. This is the dragon that I think of with compiler design. Okay, so uh, we need to kind of understand these, these optimization, uh, th these optimizers in order to really understand performance. So, so my suggestion is that we actually dive through compilers and figure out how they work. And we actually understand the piece of software that's going to be transforming your code. So first off, what parts of the compiler do we want to talk about today? So, so there are three kind of huge pieces of the compiler we can point at. We have the front end at the top. At the bottom, we have the code generator, which is actually responsible for producing executable code. And then in the middle, we have this optimizer. It's this kind of weird thing. And, and if, you, if, you, if you read the Dragon book, if you, if you studied that, that book, you would see that it talks about the front end, and it talks about the code generator, and it doesn't even really mention the optimizer. It has a few very minor comments about the optimizer, but it doesn't really spend a lot of time on it. And this talk is only going to discuss the optimizer. 
We're going to completely ignore the front end, completely ignore the code generator. If you want to learn about those things, you can go read the Dragon book, you can go take a compiler's class. There are many places to learn about these. But I want to focus on this optimizer because it's a very uh, less well understood component of compilers today. This is essentially optimization 101. Now, as, as a consequence, this is very much a lecture. I'm going to be trying to teach you, you all things. But that means I need your help. Because at some point during this talk, you will be completely lost about what I'm saying. Unlike a lot of the other talks this, uh, this conference, I want you to interrupt me. I want you to like, put up your hand, like jump up and down, whatever you have to do to get our attention. And we're going to take a question, and I'll try and answer, because otherwise, we're not going to be able to make progress. This is much more of a, of a, of a lecture-style thing, much less of a, uh, just you know, me talking the whole time. If you let me talk the whole time, I'll end up finishing early. It'll be awkward. right? You got, so you have to help me out with that. You think you, is this a responsibility you're OK with? Nodding? OK, OK, excellent. So here is our program. It's not actually very C++ at all, sorry. But it is, it is relevant. So this is a very simple program. Okay? Right, we've got a function. It does some things with the arguments. right? It calls some other functions. Nothing too fancy. Okay? This is a really simple program. So this should be a great program to kind of illustrate how the compiler works. Right? And it's, it's tiny, right? so we'll be able to kind of think about it in our heads, we'll be able to put stuff on the slides about it. So this is how Clang uh, models this tiny program. So, so there's a lot, of, a lot of information. This is actually about the first of eight pages of Clang's representation of that program. All right, so tiny program, eight pages of, of tree-like data structure in Clang. Okay, and it really does keep going. And you can kind of see some relevant pieces in here, right? We can see that we have you know, a Boolean, right, that we're comparing against things. We have some conversions, lots of, lots of uh, tree representations. The front end is actually incredibly complex. The whole, the whole dragon book actually was kind of onto something with that. Uh, parsing languages is incredibly complex. And so this is the AST uh, produced by Clang. And AST stands for Abstract Syntax Tree. This is a terrible name for this data structure. On the first point, it's not at all abstract. It is completely concrete and precise. There's nothing abstracted here at all. You can, you can see that we have every single precise location of every character relevant here. We've abstracted nothing. Okay? The second problem is that this isn't talking about the syntax half the time. Most of these nodes in here are invisible. Implicit cast expressions, an array subscripts with more implicit cast expressions, a, a reference to a declaration. None of these things are syntactic. So it is simultaneously an incredibly concrete, specific, and precise tree. And it is, it is not talking about the syntax alone. It's talking about the syntax and the semantics. And it gets worse than that. It's also not a tree. It's a DAG. But anyways. Despite all of that, we call it an AST. So, so this won't actually help us optimize anything, unfortunately. It's too much information. Okay, It's too specific and it's too precise. It has far more to do with the source code than what we want to optimize. So we reduce all of the program down into something much more simple to reason about in order to optimize it. That's the first thing we do. And, and for Clang, it reduces us down to an intermediate representation of the semantics of the program when executing, as opposed to the kind of language constructs used to form it. All right? And that's the LLVM IR, uh, where IR stands for intermediate representation. And, and if you do that, you get something like this. And this is still a whole lot of stuff that no one really understands yet. How many folks here have ever worked with LLVM? Got a few people. All right, so, so for those of you who have not worked with LLVM, this is going to be a really fun talk, because I'm going to essentially teach you everything you need to know to understand how LLVM works. After this talk, you will actually understand how LLVM works. Now, I will admit, I'm going to focus on Clang and LLVM. That's what I know best. That's what I work on. Uh, but I'll try and mention where, where things are fairly general and apply to lots of compilers in the world, and where they're very specific to LLVM. But we need to understand what this does, because this right now is just a bunch of weird words and you know, weird syntax highlighting. So we need to dive, dive in and actually do a quick you know, uh, uh, brain dump on what the LLVM intermediate representation looks like and how it works. All right. So let's, let's talk about LLVM's IR. So here is something you can probably understand. If you write software, you can probably grasp what this does. We're declaring one function at the very top called G. Okay. Then we're defining another function, 
It accepts a couple of arguments. You can see that we have types for those arguments. They're 32-bit integers. And we have names, right? The little percent sign in front of the letter gives it a name. We then have some code here. We're adding things. We're calling another function, right? And we're adding more things, and then we're returning the value. You can see that we, we annotate. Every time we use one of these types, we annotate it, uh, one of these names, we annotate it with the type. So we get kind of bidirectional type checking out of this. It's a little bit verbose, but this is mostly machine generated. And so having the, the consistency checking is very nice. And the machine is very, has a very easy time generating this code. Now, one important thing to understand about this representation are where these names come from. This isn't an assignment like you're used to in C, C++, or Java. This is what's called single static assignment, or static single assignment. You can find it both ways. It doesn't matter. SSA form. And what that means is that assignments can only happen once and are static. They never change. So this percent %c is permanently assigned to the value of this addition. And in fact, we, we actually don't even talk about them being separate. Percent %c is really just the name given to this instruction. All right? That, that's its entire identity. And we never break that invariant. Is it making some sense? All right. So this is, this is, this is nice. We have you know, basic linear function here, but we need to handle control flow. So to do control flow, we introduce a couple of new constructs. We have multiple basic blocks, okay? And each basic block is just a sequence of instructions that are executed in sequence. And we have entry as a basic block, then, and else, okay? Every basic block ends with an instruction that transfers control to some other location. Every basic block ends that way. So the first basic block ends with a branch instruction. And not just any branch instruction, but a conditional one. We have a flag here. And based on the value of that flag, 0 or 1, because it's, it's a 1-bit flag, we either send control flow to the then basic block or the else basic block. OK? And in then, we have a call. And then we return control to the caller with that value. All right? So return is also a, a terminal instruction. And then the else block has a very simple terminator, just returns a value directly. Make sense? Everybody following the control flow here? That's really all there is for control flow. This is all the control flow constructs. I mean, there's some, there some other instructions that are more complicated than branch, but they all follow the same model. They explicitly transfer control flow to some particular destination. All right? Now, that gives us control flow, but we don't yet have a way to kind of move data through this graph because all of these variables aren't actually variables, right? They're assigned. Yes, one question. So the, the question is, what is the point of the entry label? Well, you, you could, in theory, branch back to the entry label. It doesn't actually happen, but it's a theoretical thing. But every basic block, just like every instruction, has a name. And you can refer to it like we do here. And so every basic block has a name, and we gave a name to the entry basic block. So, so we need some way to move data through this, but we don't actually have variables. We have singly and statically assigned names for an instruction. And so that can't actually you know, choose between two different values. There's no way to actually represent data flow here. So the way LLVM represents data flow is based on this single static assignment form. It's a very important paper in, in, in kind of compiler technology development. And, and it uses a very special instruction called a fee node. Okay? And what a fee node does is it actually mentions the edges where control flow comes into the basic block. So this is, this is a fee node for the end basic block. And it's saying that there are two predecessors to end. That is, there are two edges where control can enter this basic block. One of them is from entry, and we can see that here, right, with the branch. One of them is from the then basic block, and we can see that here. Making sense? Now, based on which edge control travels along when it enters this function, this fee will take on a different value, okay? 
If the control con comes in on an edge from entry, it takes on the C value. If control comes in on the edge from then, it takes on the D value. Whichever it is, the new value is in result, and we can do anything we want with it normal single static assignment form. Making sense here how data flows through this graph, right? Everybody happy with this? Okay. So this is, a, so, so here's kind of the most amazing thing. We're done. That's LLVM's IR. We've covered all of the fundamental and important constructs of LLVM's IR for the purpose of understanding optimization, okay? It is an incredibly simple model. It's very reductive. We, re we take away a lot of information and come down to this very simple, very predictable model. This is one of the most powerful things about LLVM's IR because it makes it very easy to teach, very easy to understand, and then fairly easy to reason about. You tend to use the same patterns over and over again rather than having to know about hundreds of different variations on something. And that's, that's a really very important property to this, to this system, okay? Okay, so, so now we, everyone think they're happy with the LVMIR? Think you'll be able to read my next slides with LVMIR? Some nodding, all right? Cool, so let's, 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 let's figure out, where were we? We were looking at the IR for Hello World, all right? So let's go back to that. So unfortunately, this doesn't look anything like the examples I showed you. I mean, it's, it, it's, first off, it's a lot of it, right? It's kind of hard to see, but, but even worse, right? We have these allocations, we have a bunch of other things that we can talk about, loads and stores and all kinds of other stuff. This doesn't look like what we were used to seeing. And this is actually the first clue to what the optimizer's role is in the compiler. It actually does much more than just producing really efficient code, okay? The optimizer has a lot larger scope it also is responsible for several other phases of the optimizer, okay? The first thing that the optimizer is going to do is clean up after the front end, okay? The front end, right, we started with this code over here, which was fairly simple, and we produced this very long pile of IR here, which is really complicated. So we need to do something to kind of clean this up. Producing very uh, uh, naive IR in the front end is a significant simplification to building a front end. And so we instead rely on the optimizer to put it into kind of predictable and expected SSA form. All right, so the first step of cleanup is going to do this, which is kind of fast, but I'll, I'll walk through the primary thing it did here. So before we had all of these allocations, if you look at the very top, right, we're allocating memory and we're storing and we're loading from this memory. The first thing the optimizer is going to do is it's going to try and, and just replace trivially evident stores and loads with that single static assignment form and with fee nodes to represent data flow around the control flow graph. And so if we look at the new version of it, we don't have any of those allocations, all right? And we have a fee node at the bottom that handles the actual data flow, okay? And you can see kind of more what's going on here. It's gonna start to correspond. Right, we start off with the comparison, right? And indeed, we have a comparison over here, right? And if it goes in one direction, right, if, if, if argc is in fact not equal to three, then we jump to this end location, right? Or sorry, we go jump to the then location. We look at the then, and the then just returns. We can look at the return, and if we come from this then location, we select the value negative one, and we return that value. Making some sense? This is starting to look like this code. Now, if we, if we go to the end location, right, because this, this, this comparison failed, which means this comparison failed, we end up here. And we start to see code that looks more like what we would, we would expect. So there's this weird get element pointer thing here. That's a little bit unusual. The get element pointer is essentially doing pointer arithmetic. It's a strange formulation for pointer arithmetic. Instead of adds and multiplies, we instead have this very confusing get element pointer. But you can think of it as essentially doing array subscripting. That's, that's the idea here. Then we load, we call, we do more pointer arithmetic, we load more things, we call, and then we add things together, okay? And this is essentially modeling these two calls, where we have a pointer subscript, right? And so we do the arithmetic, we load, and we call to A to I. Okay, and we do that again, call A to I, and then we sum the results, right? 
with this add, and we return that value. Folks liking this so far? Why we can't directly return in the if then? That's the that's question we had at the front. So, so we're going to get to, the, to why this is in the particular way it is. My big question is, do you understand the model? And it sounds from the questions you're asking, you do, which is great. All right, so, so let's, let's figure out why it is that this looks this way. Right? And that's actually step two, which is called canonicalization. Because there are a million different ways you can write code. Let's look at a trivial set of examples, right? All of these things, right, assuming no weird side effects or anything else, all of these programs do the exact same thing. They produce the same result. But there are a bunch of different ways to write them, even at the C level. There are just as many ways to represent them inside of LLVM's IR. And we don't want to kind of reason about all of these different variations, right? We'll keep guessing, we'll go back and forth. It'll be really hard for us to predict the right what pattern to expect. To, to make the optimizer not have this explosion of complexity, we have to canonicalize each of these patterns into the same predictable pattern that the optimizer is expecting, okay? And so if we look at this code, right, there are a bunch of things that are kind of weird and idiosyncratic about this that we can, we can kind of start to canonicalize. So the very first thing is we're comparing against not equal to. Right? And the, the, the canonicalizer is going to look at that and say, like, well, not equal to and equal to are pretty much the same thing. I'd like to not have to reason about both of them. And so it will simply reverse operands as necessary to always form equal to. And so I know it's quick, but you can see we have not equal to here. Right? We have two labels here in a particular order. We switch it to equal to and we flip the order of the labels, which preserves the semantics, but brings us to kind of a consistent pattern. We always prefer equality tests over not equal. All right, so that's the first step of canonicalization. The next step is exactly what you asked about. Why do we have this if-then return? All right, we can, we can fix that and just go directly to return, and we have to fix up this fee node to mark that now the predecessor is this entry block, right? Not, not just uh, not the if-then block. Make sense? And so the optimizer is going to do this very systematically throughout all of the code. And, and you might think this is a trivial thing, but this is actually incredibly important. This is probably the most important thing that the optimizer can do to manage its own complexity and to manage this, the kind of explosion of state space it's required to look at. And this is actually an area where LLVM is uncommonly effective. Uh, it is one of the most effective canonicalizers among all of the compilers we've seen out there. Uh, GCC, ICC, and Microsoft's compiler all tend to be substantially less effective at canonicalizing. They tend to have to handle a wider explosion of, of, of permutations of code as a consequence. This is an area that LLVM really pushes very hard, and part of that comes from this very minimalistic and reductive IR. We have to because we form so many different patterns of IR. All right, any questions about, about this canonicalization idea before I, I start moving on? Yes? In the, in the code uh, that uh, came from the front end, I saw something that looked a bit like the uh, uh, entry frame, uh, like the stack frame of yes. the function, and here it disappears, and then I, ex I imagine it uh, appears again after the in the code generation phase. So, is it really necessary to 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 like do it like this? Um, so, so, so the idea here is that the front end actually has some information that gets actually removed here, and and it does. And the idea is that we want to make this intermediate form simpler, so it's easier to optimize. All right. So let's let's keep going to the third phase because this is where we're going to spend most of our time, collapsing abstractions. Okay. So this is the third major activity of the high-level optimizer. This is actually where, where I, I, I spend most of my time. This is the part of it I love. Because if you write C++ code, you'll understand that one of the, the kind of the promises of C++ are zero-cost abstractions, right? Zero-cost being this kind of you know, very lofty goal that is often very hard to achieve. And, and this is actually the part of the compiler that most often steps in to allow you to have truly zero-cost abstractions. So, so let's start digging into exactly what uh, abstractions your program is made up of. I'm going to make a bold claim that there are exactly three abstractions in all of your software. 
all right? Everything comes down to essentially functions, right? And calls between functions, right? Loads and stores and memory and loops or iteration. Now, if you want to think about, about why this is the case, think back, to, think back to Turing machines, right? Think back to the very basics of programming, all right? What do you need to have a Turing machine? Well, you need to have tape, which we represent typically with memory loads and stores, all right? You need to have branches, which control flow, right? You need to have iteration. The two things that form loops are a branch and iteration, right? And then the final thing, functions, are what we add as programmers in order to reason about large, complex programs. So functions are completely synthetic. There's no need to have a function in your program. But you, the programmers, actually add functions because that's how you can comprehend the software you're building. Okay? And so of all of these things, functions are probably the most important to remove because they're the ones that are truly synthetic. They, they, they have no business being in the basic computational model. Memory and loops will only be able to help a certain amount because there has to be memory and there has to be iteration. There has to be control flow. Otherwise, there's, there's, there's nothing at all uh, to, to compute about. But some of both memory and some of loops are, are actually abstractions as well, added by programmers because they need to reason about things in a simpler way, and we want to take those out. We essentially want to reduce your program down to this very minimal state that looks very much like the basics of computation, that looks like the control flow, iteration, and, and memory accesses necessary to compute something, not ones added by programmers to reason about their software. So, so all of the other uh, fundamental optimizations, which I'm going to completely skip over, if you ever have taken an optimizer class, there are lots of things discussed there that I'm not going to talk about, because I'm going to focus on this collapsing of abstractions. All right, so let's talk first about function calls. This is, this is probably the most important one. It's purely synthetic, and yet it's incredibly uh, impactful. The optimization which collapses function call abstractions is called inlining, all right? And that's essentially taking a function which is being called by some other function and just inlining that code into the other function, which is a very nice way to reduce abstractions. It's the single most important optimization in every compiler I'm aware of because this is the purely synthetic abstraction boundary programmers insert. If we don't remove these, we get nonsense code uh, for, out of the optimizer. Unfortunately, this is also just about the hardest optimization in the entire compiler. Okay, it's, it's absolutely impossible to get this perfect because it suffers from the Goldilocks problem. Uh, so how many folks here have heard of the uh, American fable about Goldilocks? Not very many, yeah. So, so this is this really terrible uh, uh, story. You can, you can look it up. It's, it's absolutely terrible in its original form uh, from, from the Grimm brothers. It's a very dark and kind of scary thing that because, you know, we, we don't like to think of dark, scary things, we've kind of, you know, cleaned it up and fantasized about it. And it's this idea that, you know, a girl goes to this house, right, and she's hungry, right? And there are three, there are three bowls of porridge that she wants to go and eat from, okay? She tries one bowl and it's too cold. She tries another bowl and it's too hot. And then she finds the third bowl and it's just right. And the fable goes on as she tries these alternatives. And then she discovers at the end of it that this house she's in belongs to three bears, a little bear, a middle bear, and a tall bear, and they come in and eat her. Because it's a grim kind of scary story. And this is exactly what I feel like when I work on the optimizer. Because if you inline too much, you end up making your code look like this scary monstrosity, right? If you just keep inlining away all of these abstractions, you bloat the code beyond all reason, right? It's terrible. But if you don't inline enough, then the optimizer just turns off because all it sees are abstractions and it doesn't know how to reason about what your program does. So you somehow have to find the porridge that's exactly the right temperature. It's incredibly hard, okay? And there's no right answer. There's no perioptimal state that you can pursue here. And that makes it a very frustrating part of the optimizer to work on. And you end up producing programs that look like this. All right, so how does the inliner in LLVM work? The first thing we need to do is we need to be able to reason about these function calls that make up your program. And we do that using graph theory, okay? So we can imagine that each of these green arrows is a function call between each of the functions, all right? So A over here calls B, B calls C, C calls A. The first thing you'll know, and this is true in all of the real function call graphs in the world, they're cycles, 
okay? This isn't an acyclic graph, it's just a directed graph. So the very first thing we do is we try and apply some graph theory to reason about these function calls. And we identify what are called strongly connected components, right? And that's, that's all of the nodes which participate in a set of cycles. When we and so if you look at these, we can see there are three cycles here, right? A, B, and C, D, E, and F, and G, H, and I, okay? So that's the first thing. We identify these, these strongly connected components. Now we have a directed acyclic graph between the strongly connected components of functions. Making sense? Once we have this directed acyclic graph, we can do interesting things from a graph theory perspective. Notably, we can traverse it in a topological order, okay? So we can start down at this leaf, which is easy to reason about. Because if we're trying to remove function call ab abstractions, right, this leaf is really easy to reason about because it doesn't call anything else. There's, there's nothing to do, right? It's very straightforward. So we start in this kind of bottom-up walk in order to, to allow ourselves to, to kind of break apart these abstractions in a reasonable way. This so is called a bottom-up, SEC-based call graph walk, which is a bit of a mouthful, right? All right, so we start here. And we look at these functions, okay? And we, for now, we're gonna, we, we can ignore the cycles, right? We're gonna just look at these, these functions as a unit. They don't call anything else, okay? So there's no function call abstraction to remove. We let the rest of the optimizer run on them because all of the function call abstractions are already gone for these three. And then we kind of go bottom up and look at the next set, okay? Now we look at these and we can actually say, ah, we have one interesting inlining opportunity here where E calls G. The nice thing is, we've already optimized G, okay? We've already optimized it, we've, we've you know, deleted all the dead code we can, we've, we've inlined things, there wasn't anything else to do, right? It's as easy to analyze as we can make it at this point. And that means when we try to understand whether or not that we should inline G into E, we have the maximum amount of information about G. We're not, we're not being bothered by other abstractions, okay? And then we can finish that SEC, move on to the next, right? And again, we've now fully optimized this SEC, right? If we can inline G into E and inline E into D, we've already done that. And if that simplifies D, we can see that. And that lets us make an accurate estimate about whether to inline D into B, okay? So this is really important bottom-up walk. Now this doesn't help us within a cycle. Within a cycle, right, we don't have this topological ordering. So we just have to pick an order and, and within each SEC we just walk in that order. And if we want to get really fancy, we can iterate a few times within the SEC to understand it. But by chopping up the graph into these connected components and walking in topological order over it, we, we constrain the space that we have to do this expensive search over because we can do everything else in an ordered fashion. All right, is this making sense to folks? Do I see any nods? <laughs> okay, so you said that uh, the dead code is uh, optimized during uh, the bottom-up way. So first it will be for the yellow uh, connected component eliminated. Uh, so if there is some dead code that calls from I to C, would it affect the optimizer? That In calls the, from? From I to C. But to it's see. a dead code, so it, it is just some, something, maybe just even as simple as if false, call C. Yes, okay, so, so the question is, you know, before we built all of these SECs, what if there was a call edge from I over to C here? And this was actually one big connected component. And then we go and we delete that call, how do we then reevaluate it? That's actually a great question. The current inliner in LLVM doesn't handle that exact case. There is a four-year project to rebuild the infrastructure in a way that allows LLVM's inliner to detect when we change the cyclic structure and rebuild the topological walk in order to handle that. But it turns out to be incredibly complicated. It also turns out to not happen so often, and so we haven't been motivated before the last few years to really change this. But it's a great observation. It is a limitation in the way it works right now. Uh, if I have a recursive call, then uh, does LVM change it to like 
using a tail course to, to, to some, could it change it to, to a loop? And if it does some, when does it do? So, so there's a question, what happens if you have recursive calls? Right now, recursive calls are, uh, so, so direct recursive calls are, are not modeled in the call graph itself. And LLVM actually doesn't optimize them very well. There's also a major effort in LLVM to do that, but it also hasn't made a lot of progress. Um, direct recursive calls don't actually come up as often as you might think, though, um, in hot code. All right, I want to keep moving to make sure we get to some other stuff, so let's, let's keep looking. So the big question here is we have this inlining decision to make, right? Like, we have this inlining edge decision. And that's essentially a cost modeling question. And the question is, how does the optimizer actually model the cost to decide whether or not to inline? And this is, this is actually the hard part of inlining. I mean, the actual transformation of inlining a function is easy. But this cost modeling and this evaluation of complexity is incredibly complicated. And it's based primarily on context. So let, let's look at some examples. So we have this function g, OK? It's a very straightforward function. We also have a function f. All f does is kind of rearrange arguments and then call g. This happens all the time in real code. It's a wrapper function. It's an adapter, right? This actually comes up constantly. And so we definitely want to inline this because the complexity of calling f right, like, is the same as the complexity of calling g. That's all it's doing. If we can inline this, we just replace one function call with another function call. This is always a win. OK? And so we really want to inline this case. It's a really good example. Let's look at another example that's perhaps more interesting. Ima imagine this fancy sort function, OK, Th that you're going to call before you call std sort. So this std sort is some big, complicated algorithm. But you notice most of your containers are empty, right? You don't need, you don't need a lot of complexity to sort an empty container. You've also got a lot of containers that have one element. You don't need a lot of complexity to sort one element. It is sorted. You're done. So, so OK, we can, we can handle this pretty well, right? Let's write our custom sort function. It's fancier, right? The first thing it does is it says, hey, if the size is less than 1, less than or equal to 1, we're done. And then even if it's two, it's actually really easy. It's just one swap, right? We can, we can do both halves of this one go super fast, right? Really, really nice. And then we fall back to std sort for everything else. So now, to, to figure out if this is a good inlining candidate, we have to know a lot about the caller of fancy sort, right? We have to know whether its size is going to hit one of these special cases in which case, this is clearly a good inline candidate, right? If, it's, if it hits this special case, inlining, it just deletes the code, right? That's, that's got to be a win. But if it doesn't hit any of these special cases, we're just going to add special cases to code, right? And then have the fallback. We haven't made anything better, OK? And this is, this is the challenge of the inline cost estimation. It depends on this argument, this vector. And so we have to have really precise context when we call the function and then apply that context to analyze the body of the function in order to estimate cost. Make sense? This is, this is a huge part of the LVM optimizer. All right. As you might imagine, this doesn't always work, OK? This is a, an incredible, incredible challenge. So let's look at a case where this doesn't always work. And this is actually from real code. This is actually something that, that actually came up working on, on C++ code uh, and, and working on the LLVM optimizer. So imagine you have code that looks like this. Has some function, right? Takes some big state object, does a bunch of complex stuff on it, then produces a final value, all right? And now you have this variadic function, OK? Classical variadic function. Now, if you call this variadic function with a whole lot of arguments here, OK, what you're actually going to do is you're going to create this incredibly tall chain of calls, OK? Incredibly tall, maybe hundreds of calls deep. And inside of each one of those, right, you're going to have some complex code. And then you're going to kind of peel one element off and part of that. And then you're going to call kind of the next, the next thing. It's just this long chain of code. Now, the inliner, it's going to work bottom up. So it's going to start at the very bottom, and that one's going to be an easy case. Like, maybe it inlines that one, because this complex code isn't, it isn't too much code. So maybe the inliner doesn't. Then it inlines again and again and again. At some point, it gives up. 
because this complex code, several layers of this complex code add up to a giant pile of code, and it's way more than the inliner wants to deal with. So the inliner gives up, goes on about its way, right? Pops up and up and up and up that call stack, and eventually it hits a caller at the very top of the call stack, which sees, oh, wait a minute. We called this thing with a bunch of arguments. Every single one of the arguments is a constant. All of them, right? But we didn't inline some of those intermediate functions, okay? So, so what we see is we see a bunch of constant arguments being passed in to a function that then calls another function, then calls another function, then calls another function, and we lost track of it, right? The inline cost estimation completely falls over here. We have no way of connecting the context at the first call with constant arguments to the actual inlining decision that matters at the bottom. Okay? And so constructs like variadic templates, which in introduce an incredibly deep stack of function calls, are very dangerous to the optimizer. That doesn't mean they're bad, it just means that they're risky. And so you've got to watch out, especially when you have this complex code inside of a variadic call stack. That means that it may be hard for the compiler to completely flatten this and give you simple looking code. Making sense? All right. So a lot about function calls. Let's talk a little bit about another abstraction. Let's talk about memory, loads and stores to memory. I, I tend to spend less time talking about loads and stores to memory because I actually think programmers tend to have a good intuition about what, how memory works and, and what, what constitutes memory in their software. This is probably the least confusing part of the optimizer's abstraction kind of destruction mechanism. So here, here's some kind of typical code, okay? And what this code is gonna do is it's going to try and form that SSA form. It's gonna try and take loads and stores, which are in memory, and lift them out of memory into this high-level SSA form that you can represent. So we start with you know, allocated memory here, some stores, some stores, a load, and a result. The primary thing that the optimizer is trying to do is to take this and turn it into something that looks like this. The way the optimizer does this is it kind of thinks about what values are available at each location in memory in each part of the control flow graph. So it, let's let's start with let's start with the uh, sorry let's start with the memory okay so in the memory one we start off with the entry block, and we store this value c into it. All right, at the end of this entry basic block, we know that the value of c is available in this memory location. We then go to then right, and we store a value d into it. Okay, then at the end of the then basic block, we go to end. And so as end happens, we know that depending on control flow, we have one of two possible values in that memory location. And this is how the optimizer chooses to lower it. We remove all of the stores, but we track these as available values in the control flow graph. And then when we see this merge point in end, we insert a fee node to select between the possible available values. Making sense? All right. So. Then we see, but like that, that's, that's a very simple thing, right? That's the, these are loads and stores that the, the front end introduced for you. You didn't even write these in your code. And then the optimizer just cleaned it up with a very simple algorithm. The more interesting case where we're actually breaking through an abstraction that programmers use is when you have structures, when you have aggregates of lots of different values and some layout in memory. And that tends to look like this. And this starts to get a little bit bigger. Sorry for that. So at the very top, we have a type this percent uh, s, which is our struct type. And we say it has three 32-bit integers in this type. All right, That's the memory layout that, it, that this particular aggregation is using. We allocate this in memory. And then we have to do pointer arithmetic. So this is doing pointer arithmetic. You can think of it like an array index. Right? So this is the zeroth element in that array that we get in that structure, the first and the second element of the structure. And we go into each one and we store percent %c, then 0, and then 0. So we have three values in the memory, percent %c, 0, and 0. And this is actually going to be in memory because the programmers wrote something that put this in memory. When you have this aggregation, you fundamentally have a memory construct. And the optimizer is going to try and remove that abstraction for you. And so we actually uh, have to partition this memory into distinct slices 
that you're accessing so that the original algorithm of you know, tracking the available values works and we can put this into SSA form, okay? So the very first thing we do is we slice this up into each of those I32 slices following this pointer arithmetic. And so then we see more stores to those slices, loads down here, but now they're all independent. Instead of being part of the same memory, we partition it into independent pieces of memory. And then we run the other algorithm and track what values are available in memory. We insert fee nodes to handle the selection. In other cases, we actually fold it all the way through and we get the result. Make sense? So this is what most of the memory abstraction reduction looks like. Okay, so memory is kind of boring. What about loops? Do we really need to talk about loops? I used to think loops were really boring. I didn't like them. I didn't want to talk about them. I didn't feel like there were a lot of interesting abstractions in loops. Because, you know, if you really cared about writing loops, right, you, you don't write in C++, right? If you really care about loops, write in Fortran. How many folks here have written Fortran? Anyone? It's a beautiful language. You should go try it sometime. Uh, it will challenge you because you have to think about problems differently to write in Fortran. It's not, it's not a language for writing general purpose programs, and so it, it really forces you to think differently. Um, but it, it has its beauty. It has this really clear modeling of mathematical problems that we used to solve in computers all the time. And I thought, you know, this is where all the loops are. Like, we can leave it to the Fortran compilers to optimize them. I'm busy inlining, inlining all of the wrapper functions and adapters in my C++ code, right? But it turns out there are a bunch of interesting loops in C++ these days. Uh, anyone here heard of the Eigen project? A few people? You should go read up on Eigen. It's a fascinating project. It uses templates to, to allow you to essentially write very complex mathematical programs, and then the templates themselves enable domain-specific optimizations, which then gets lowered in, through, through C++ into LLVM. If you're using Clang at LLVM, we optimize it further. It's great stuff, all right? It does amazing, amazing things. And it's probably responsible for a very substantial fraction of all of the world's compute cycles these days. A really astonishing fraction of compute cycles, both on your mobile device and in data centers, are spent inside of Eigen. It's, it's remarkable to me. Because if you're using uh, machine learning, right, if you're using any kind of machine learning based framework, it's probably using Eigen under the hood. All right, which is kind of remarkable to me. And, and this is all in C++. So we need to think a little bit about what it looks like to optimize loop abstractions. Okay, so let's look at a loop. This is, this is my favorite loop to try and optimize. It's, it's, it's beautiful, right? Simple. This is one statement, right? This is, this is the tr most trivial loop in the whole wide world. So let's look at what the LLVM compiler generates for this code when I, when I compile targeting uh, x86, for example. That's the IR. Maybe a little bit hard to read, that's okay. There's a lot of it, it's, I, I, even I can't read it, it's, it's totally lost, right? This is just a tremendous amount of code from this tiny little function, right? Tiny little loop. But, but what the optimizer is doing is it's trying to find an incredibly efficient way to execute it. But that's not really collapsing abstraction. So we're gonna look at somewhat different loops to understand the actual nature of loop optimizations inside of the LLVM compiler. All right, so let's look at a, a simpler loop and let's look at it directly in LLVM's IR. So this is actually the same loop I showed you, okay? Um, but before all of the crazy stuff has happened. Right, so we come in at the beginning, right? We load some stuff, right? We load the, the begin pointer out of the vector, right? We, we load the end pointer, we check to see uh, where things are, right? We go to the loop head. In loop head, we have these lovely fee nodes. Do our comparison to see if we're at the end. If we're at the end, we exit. If we're not at the end, right? We keep going. If we keep going, we, we you know, load, load through the pointer, do a sum, and then we, we, inde we, we increment the index and we go back to the head. Does that make sense where this loop is going? So the loop is kind of going round and round and round and round and round these two basic blocks until it stops here when it's done and it goes to the exit. Make sense? That's what iteration looks like in LLVM. Doesn't use anything more than we've already seen. It's just a particular pattern of branches that turn into a loop. So, now we see this, but the, the first thing you should kind of think about is there are a million different ways to write this, right? 
So the very first thing we have to do is we actually have to canonicalize it, just like we do with the scalar IR. We have to pick a very specific representation of the loop in order to get it right. And LLVM has a very, very specialized representation that it wants every loop to be in. OK, so, so the very first transformation looks like this. And it may be a little bit surprising what, what this is doing. So the first thing it does is it has a precondition, OK? It, it separates the condition about whether it should even begin to loop into a separate check up here at the top. All right. The next thing it does is it inserts a dedicated basic block that is outside the loop but always enters the loop, this loop pre-header, or loop.ph. All right. This always enters the loop. Okay. Now we don't have a separate basic block. Now the loop is just this one basic block that we go over and over and over and over and over again until we stop, we go to the exit, and then we fall out of the exit. And you'll also see this exit block. We have a dedicated basic block, which is only reached when you leave the loop. So if we didn't loop at all, you never showed up here. But when we leave the loop, we always reach this, and then this falls through to the final exit, OK? The last thing of loop canonicalization we're doing here is this phi node. Because this phi node looks different from every other phi node you've seen. There isn't a merge between two control flow edges here. This exit only has one predecessor, the loop block. But we still have a phi node for it. This merely marks that a value defined inside the loop and redefined every time this loop iterates is actually used outside. It, it's actually the thing that you know, escapes out of the loop and has continued to be used. We insert this marker phi node so we can recognize those values. They're often called loop live out values. Make some sense? All right, so this is the canonical form for the loop. So the first thing I want to kind of show you is why this is useful. So let's imagine some things transform, maybe after inlining or something else, and actually change the inputs to the loop and see how they propagate. So the thing I want you to look at is this end and the begin up here, right? The precondition to check whether or not we're going to loop at all. So what happens if end becomes a constant distance from begin? All right, so again, we, we, we've had this get element pointer, so we did an array index here to try and find the end, and we loaded the end out of memory, so we couldn't see it before. But what if some other transformation made what that loaded value was apparent, like it is here, where we can just compute end directly as being four past the beginning? OK? Once you do this, it becomes very clear that we don't actually loop at all, we actually can predict that this is going to execute this basic block exactly four times. So if we can turn this into a four, then the loop optimizer can say, hey, I, this, this branch down here happens a predictable number of times. It happens exactly four times. And so we can turn this entire loop basic block that iterates into this basic block, which has four iterations. All right. See, we're, we're, we're incrementing by one, incrementing by one, incrementing by one, and incrementing by one. But then we definitively exit at the end. We don't have an actual loop anymore. Okay, This is unrolling. This is called loop unrolling and full unrolling. And this is a huge abstraction removal. How many folks have written a for loop with the number four right, in, in, the, in the bound of it? Because you were going to write the same statement like four times. It is a total waste of time to write it. You just write once in a little loop, right? That's an abstraction that you as the programmer put in. And this is how the optimizer removes it and produces efficient code. Make sense? So anyone who tells you that, oh, that's less efficient, you should use a macro or something to stamp out eight iterations, you shake your head at them. And you're like, no, my optimizer will do that for me. OK? Making sense. All right, let's look at the next one. So imagine we have some other computation inside of the loop that doesn't actually depend on the loop. Okay, 
And so here we have first, okay? And we're going to take first, we're going to load first off of begin. Now begin isn't part of the loop. Begin isn't changing as the loop iterates. And so every time we load first, we get the exact same value, right? We just keep loading it over and over and over and over again, which doesn't have any point, okay? And we want to sync that. So, so, so we've got this first. We know that it's used, so it's used down here. Uh, like we actually use first down here. And then we take that and we use it again here, and then we actually do a multiplication by it. Okay, so we didn't need this first unless we went through the loop, but we don't have to compute it each time, and so we can sync the first load into the loop exit, all right? This is a loop invariant code motion. It's essentially taking code that you wrote inside the loop because that was way more convenient and just moving it out of the loop because it trivially had nothing to do with the loop itself, all right? And the compiler is very good at this. We can move things out of the loop. We can hoist things over the loop. We're really, really good at it. Okay, we have, this, we have this next loop. And so the next thing we want to do is we want to try and, and, and uh, try and widen the loop in some way here, okay? And so you might notice something down here at the bottom. I have this weird vectorization stuff, okay? And that's in order to cause this to happen. So when we're looking at this loop, it's this kind of scalar loop. It's going one chunk at a time, very predictable pattern. But that's not very efficient. We can do a lot better than that inside of this loop. We can actually do a whole bunch of these sums at the same time, which would be much more efficient. And so the optimizer can kind of reason about this loop body, and it can see that, like, okay, so I could do, instead of one, I could do two or four of these at the same time. And, and it kind of does a little bit of unrolling inside the loop, and it interleaves things together to kind of try and do a chunk of work at a time, which is in a much more efficient way. And so if we do this, uh, it, unfortunately, it makes the loop quite a bit bigger. Okay, so, so we, we start from this fairly vanilla loop, much like we had to begin with, okay? And, and then we expand it. So at the top, you see loop preheader, okay? That was, that's still the preheader of the loop. But now, we're doing something. We're checking whether the number of iterations is above some minimum number, right? Are we doing enough iterations that kind of doing a chunk of them at a time is worthwhile? So we do that check, and, and if, if so, right, we actually want to go down to this vector, vectorized loop. And the vectorized loop still looks like an LLVM loop. We still have a loop preheader, we have the loop body, but now, instead of doing one thing, we're actually going to do a whole bunch of these sums at a time. So let's look at the next page, because the, this vector loop body keeps going. All right, so now we can see all of this vector body. All right, and we can see that we're actually going to, to load two different things here, right, and we do two sums. Instead of doing one at a time, we're kind of doing two at a time. Make sense? And then we come down and we iterate, just like we did before. Making some sense what we're doing here? All right. So, so that's all of the loop abstractions. Are there, are there questions, before we go on, are there any questions about loops? If I got it right, you said before that function calls and loops are total different animals, right? Yes. Okay, but isn't a loop um, most of the time not just a circular function call as it was uh, shown in the, in the graph? Uh, so, so the question is, aren't loops usually kind of recursive function calls? Uh, most, most loops are not. People tend to not write very many recursive calls in, in software these days. Um, I mean, unless you're writing in a functional language, in which case you have tons of them, but they are relatively speaking rare, and they tend to occur in, in uh, places we don't care about optimizing as much. They tend to occur in, in fairly specific places. Um, ideally, what we'd like to do is we'd like to, when we see an actual recursive call, we'd like to turn it into a loop so that all of these great loop optimizations apply because we don't know how to do any of these for function calls, right? Especially this, this one where we're vectorizing, we don't know how to do that for a function call. Yeah, and um, another question is, um, you said the, um, the first uh, variable you used a couple of slides before. Yes. Isn't changing inside the loop, but that is only true for programs that are not aware of anything outside their own program. I mean, can, can't begin change from 
the outside. I mean, if I uh, load memory, and I load, and I load from my memory called begin, okay, and it is so, changed from the outside. So, so, so the idea is that we're loading from this memory each time you go through the loop. Can't something change from the outside? In theory, sure. But we don't have to operate in theory. We can actually look at this structure of the code to figure out whether that can be possible. Okay? So let's look at the code. So after we load from this memory, what happens? We have a get element pointer. Well, that just does arithmetic local to my function. Right? We have a comparison that's local to my function. We, we may go back around the loop to the beginning. We have some phi nodes that's clearly local to the function. We load from memory, but we don't store to memory, and we do an addition. So none of those operations change memory. So nothing inside of the loop is changing memory. So it's very easy to see that memory isn't changing because of code inside the loop. But now let's look at code outside of this function. Right? Maybe, maybe there's some code in some other thread changing memory. But you see, this load doesn't say anything about atomic or synchronization. Neither does this other load or any of the other instructions here. And that means that if something outside of this function is changing memory in another thread, right, then this load would be a race condition if it were observing those memory modifications. And since we know race conditions can't happen, we can, we can conclude that nothing outside of this function is changing the memory behind our back. All right? And, and LLVM has explicit modeling of atomics, much like C++ does, so that it can make that distinction, so that it can look at this load and it can say, like, no, 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 this is not an atomic load. This can't be observing something that another thread is doing. Right? And I can look at all of the se code sequence in my, co in my function, and that doesn't modify memory, so I can reason about this locally. Yes, so uh, um, you showed an example with uh, computing the sum of the vector. If I passed a vector which is known to the compiler, uh, as uh, I just passed some constants there, would it be smart enough to, well, not only unroll it, but also compute the sum of the vector using the constants. I think it's constant folding. So, so the question is, if, if not only is the size of the vector known, but actually the contents of the vector known, can it actually do the sum? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to see that with a, with a, a standard vector. But if you, if you look at how LLVM optimizes, for example, Sterlin or stircare, a C function, and if you wrote the equivalent loop in code over a, a constant string of characters, uh, we actually have special code that will try and, and actually compute what it, what, where that loop stops in the end offset and, and other things very much like that. We try very hard to do that. It's hard to do. The way we do that is we actually build an algebraic model for every computation inside of the loop. And then we see if the thing that comes out at the end and the trip count being a constant allow us to solve an equation that computes the result. And when it does, we can do that. It's very hard for us to do this when we're going through memory, but we have a few special cases where we try and do that through memory. And that's, I'm going to talk about that specifically in the next slides. Hi, I wanted to ask if uh, this, these compiler optimizations are smart enough, let's say, to take two things at one at a time. Let's say we have a structure of three ints, and we get a vector of structures like that. My next slide. OK. <laughs> Fantastic question. OK, so what happens when we combine these abstractions? Right? We've talked about like inlining and isolation, and we talked about memory and isolation, and then we talked about loops. But what happens when you know, we have structures and inline? Or, or, or your question was, what happens when we have memory and, and a loop? And, and the reasoning about the loop requires us to reason about memory. So let's look at this case. We're going to talk about structures and inlining in particular, because this is, in my opinion, what makes optimization really, really hard. Okay? Even harder than it seemed like to begin with. All right, so we have these two functions, really straightforward functions here, right? Uh, we have f and g. We declare an integer a here, or an integer c here, right? We, we call g with a, b, and c. c is an output parameter, right? We store the value of a times b into c. Makes sense as c code, right? So the interesting thing to think about, actually, what happens if you were to lower this into ir, right? This is a reference. In IR, that's actually going to be in memory, right? That's going to be a pointer. And this is going to be storing into memory, OK? And then up here, where we return, we're going to have to load from that memory in order to get the value of C back, OK?
And that makes it much harder to reason about the behavior of this code, because now we have both memory and inlining. If I can't inline G into this call for any reason, I mean, in this case, it's very trivial. But like if G, for some reason, is in another, another file, or it's really large, there's something that prevents me from inlining G into this caller, then I can't reason about the value of C here. I can't reason about the fact that like, the value of C is closely related to the value of A and B, and maybe there's a better way to implement this math. Okay, because I've, I've lost visibility into that data flow. Now compare that to the case where you actually don't put things in memory. Right? You have G where you just pass it A and B, but it returns the value of C. Right? This can be much easier for the optimizer to reason about. It has a lot more information here. It's not escaped in memory. So, so when you're looking at this G, what happens if G stores the address of C into a global variable somewhere? Right? What happens if it synchronizes with some other thread? You could do anything. Right? It's off in memory. It's unanalyzable. Whereas when it's a returned value, it's much easier to analyze what's happening here. Right? G doesn't access memory any longer at all. There's nothing about memory involved here. Right? And so it's much easier for us to reason about this. And this is a somewhat reduced example, but what happens when this scales up? So let's look at a more realistic example. This actually comes up a lot in real code, and it's incredibly frustrating to me. So you've got some struct, right? You've got some floating point values in it, you've got a double in it, and you've got some computation, right? And now you, you have some expensive computation that assigns these initial values, okay? You, you set up the delta, right? And, and there is some mathematical relationship here that's quite nice. And then you run compute. Now, the most frustrating thing to me is that when you run compute, something very unfortunate happens. All of this information, everything we've done above here in this computation, is put into memory. All of it. All of S is in memory now. We can't even split S apart into separate pieces of memory. Okay? And the reason we can't is because this member function has a this pointer. Okay? And we access all of these members off of the this pointer. So when we call this function, we have to produce a pointer to a region of memory that has this exact layout just as it is here and hand that to the compute function. And then the compute function has to pull things back out of memory and start reasoning about them. This is really complicated, right? Remember that cost estimation, that evaluation of complexity that takes place in order for the inliner to make its decision. So here comes the inliner, and it's looking at this call site. Now, what it wants to do to understand the complexity and whether or not to inline this call site is it wants to look at the context in which it's called. But we've now placed all of that context in memory instead of in SSA values. We've added an abstraction boundary in the context of this inline in cost, and now the inliner has to try and reason not just about trivial data flow, but about values in memory and how they'll be used inside the function also from memory, right? This defeats about 80% of our inline cost estimation, uh, more like 99% of our inline cost estimation, even today. We have somewhat crazy ideas that might get us to only losing 80% of our inline cost estimation, maybe at some point in the future. But this makes the estimation of all of this thing tremendously more complicated, okay? And if we just change this in a fairly simple way, the problem goes away. So imagine we just have a struct that represents this aggregation of values. And we have a separate function that accepts it by value and returns the result by value. Okay? Because this isn't a member function, there's no longer a this pointer. That's gone. We're actually passing this in by value. And that means that we don't have it in memory at all. And so when we have this code here, if, you know, after inlining, we discover that there's a constant C that is often put into this field, right? This S is no longer in memory. The inline cost estimation can track this delta value. It can see this predicate of C and consider that context when evaluating inline cost for compute, okay?
because you've taken it out of memory, you've removed one of these abstractions and given the optimizer more insight, okay? So that's, that's one of the most awesome things I like to see inside, inside the inliner. Is this, this helps us a lot. All right. So a bunch of folks, but just, just hold on, we're about done, and then you can ask all the questions. So a bunch of folks expect me to say like, ha-ha! So here is the magical tip that will solve all of your performance problems at the end of this talk. I don't have that magical tip. That's not what the point of this is. Right? The point of this is for you to kind of understand, or at least to start to understand, how this optimizer is working, how it's actually reasoning about your code, so you can make intelligent decisions. So you can think about these kinds of trade-offs and make intelligent decisions. But there's always going to be a trade-off. You're going to have to think about it differently in each context. There is not a single right or wrong answer here. And if you, if you, if you expect one, right, you're going to be disappointed. It's going to actually trip you up. You have to think about this you know, on a case-by-case -case, case basis. So hopefully you guys actually feel like you have that context. You've learned something about how the optimizer works. And I'm happy to take questions. I will try and answer them. Um, won't always succeed, but I'll do my best. Is it worth doing that? Uh, for the cost of copying the value. Here. So the question is, is it worth it for copying the value? I mean, again, you should evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis, but I would assume that it is until something says, hey, you're copying values too often, right? Like, you should be measuring. You, 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 like, if you care about performance, first off, if you care about performance, you're measuring your performance, right? If you don't measure your performance, you can't come and tell me you care about your performance because I'll ask you what your performance is and you won't be able to answer it, right? So you have to be measuring your performance. Once you're measuring your performance, right, you should generally speaking assume that copies are not expensive because generally speaking, they aren't copies, right? There doesn't necessarily have to be a copy here, right? Because this S isn't used again. And in fact, in this particular case, I guarantee you there is no copying taking place here. This S will be passed in registers, not in memory at all. There's no copy to be had here. But sometimes there will be copies, right? There'll be some copies, and you'll want to try and fix them. Before you try and, and pass things by, a, by reference, before you have output parameters, I would start off by using move semantics, right? By trying to reduce copies, by reducing your state. Output parameters tend to not actually improve the situation very much. Uh, generally speaking, um, until they're input-output parameters where you reuse a common buffer over and over again, they tend to not help. Other questions? Thank you. I would like to ask about your opinion about uh, does it make any sense uh, nowadays uh, to make explicit inline in code? Or compilers should do this better than we? So, so the question is, should you be explicitly marking code uh, as inline? This is, th this is a little bit tricky. So the first thing to realize is the inline keyword in C++ has almost nothing to do with inlining in the compiler. Which may be surprising, it actually has essentially nothing to do with inlining. So what that keyword does is it makes it possible in terms of linkage to do inlining and to put things in header files, all right? And, and there's not really a whole lot that it does past that. Most of the inlining decisions are already made in the optimizer. Now, there are special implementation tricks like the always inline attribute that GCC supports and ICC supports and Microsoft supports. Everyone has one of these attributes, right? I would strongly encourage you to not use that attribute ever, okay? If you're using that attribute, you have found a bug in the inliner of your optimizer. If you're going to use the attribute, I would ask, please, please file a bug against the optimizer first, and then add the attribute with the little comment that says, by the way, we should remove this as soon as they fix this bug over here that's hurting our performance. It should always be based on performance measurements, and you should always file a bug with, with the complaint to the optimizer about why did you not actually inline this. But yeah, it, it's rare these days, I think. Hi. How do you check the um, check and test the correctness of optimization output? Because it's it's quite challenging, in my opinion. Okay, so you're asking how do you check the correctness of the yes. optimization? Yes, yes. What what kind of test do you perform to to check if it's correct? So, so we have both a simple and also unsatisfying answer here. Uh, we don't have a very good theoretical way of doing this. So we we typically build all of the code we have access to all the tests we have access to without the optimizer turned on, and we run those tests 
and we see if those tests in fact behave the way the programmer who wrote them expected them to behave. And then for all the tests that do, you know, they work correctly without the optimizer, we turn the optimizer on and we run the same set and we build the test and we run the test and we see if they still have the behavior the programmer expected. All right? And then there's some number that don't have the same behavior after we do that. And those are either bugs in the optimizer or bugs in the program. And we typically have to stare at the code for a very long time to try and figure out which it is, which is really unsatisfactory. But uh, it happens that this is relatively rare. Uh, right? so, so at Google, when we're testing new compilers, we build hundreds of thousands of tests, we run them, we compare the results, and we have very few that actually fail uh, because we turn on the optimizer. And, it's pretty, and we can kind of go through and analyze those and reason about whether they have bugs in the code. One great way to do that is by using things like LLVM sanitizers, which I talked a whole lot about uh, yesterday. And, and I'm happy to kind of show you how those, those you know, can impact optimizers. But that, that's, that gets to a long tangent, which would be great in the, in the Q&A session later today. But we should, we should delay until then. I have a, Go ahead. Uh, I have a small comment about the inlining. Uh, so actually, the LVM inliner uses the in, uh, inline keyword key, uh, as a hint. And it gives a small bon bonus. I know that the LVM inliner uses it as a hint, but it's a very small hint. It's one we're actively trying to remove, and I strongly encourage you to not think about the inline keyword as having that property. Please don't use the inline keyword because you want it to inline something. File a bug if it doesn't inline it when you want it to. Uh, yeah. Uh, how would you compare uh, uh, LLVM intermediate representation to GCC one? How would I compare it? Well, so the first thing is you're asking the wrong person to a certain extent. Okay. I don't use both. And so, so I, I, I kind of have a very peripheral knowledge of GCC's intermediate representation. Um, from what I understand, it tends to be uh, fairly different from LLVMs. So GCC had a representation that predated uh, SSA. And, and so they actually still have pieces of that, and they've layered SSA on top of that. In some cases, this has helped them out because they have extra information in their representation that LLVM doesn't have because LLVM kind of you know, uh, used SSA at every place that it could because it had it on, like, on day one. And GCC didn't have it, and so they built up some very interesting kind of side structures that helped them represent things. Um, on the other hand, it tends to not use SSA as much as it could because they didn't have it on day one, and they've built up these side things. So it's a trade-off, right? I don't know where the right answer is in that trade off. I'm, I'm very happy with how LLVM represents things, but then I would be. I'm biased, right? So I, I don't know if I can give a really definitive answer about which one's the right representation. Hi. Uh, can you go back to this LLVM code? Uh, go back to which? Uh, uh, somewhere where the, the phi function, uh, function is used. Uh, we find example, one that's, yeah, that's example, readable. Here, here we yeah. go. For example, here. And, uh, you know, and when you, you, you told us that, you know, this, uh, for example, uh, percent %x or percent %i, Sure. Uh, is tag for the for the uh, for this you know line of of function of this 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 call? Yes. It's like a tag. It does. It's it's not a value. So uh, when you when you, you know when you loop through this code, yes. And you use this phi to 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 make a new I don't know value or make a new tag uh, for this x. It it doesn't like it. it for me, it's like it, does, it shouldn't uh, you know, keep the state because okay. it's like redefining this tag. So, so, so loads are the same way, right? So, so the, the particular value loaded may change on each iteration. The particular value produced by the, the fee node may change on each iteration. But the particular value produced by a sum may change each time a function is called. The idea is not that, that these values have a particular bit pattern that we know. The idea is that uh, they always point to the same instruction, right? The, you can't, you can't have, have a, a name X, right? And then later on say that the name X now references a different instruction, right? But the particular dynamic value produced by instruction can change, right? And that's true for all of the instructions. Okay, thanks. All right, there's a question up there. <coughs> uh, okay, I got two questions. Is optimizer liar aware of a uh, machine? That's th that we are compiling the source, and if it's aware or not, uh, I believe at uh, generation uh, code layer is another optimizer, and uh, they may cooperate each other or somehow. Okay. So, so the, the question is really like, how, how does optimization and code generation cooperate, and where 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 does knowledge of the particular machine you're targeting come in? So 
at this level, we only have a very abstract awareness of what the machine looks like. Um, and, and so we have to only make very abstract decisions. The, one of them is something like uh, this vectorization. We don't need to know exactly what vector instruction set the machine supports. We just need to know how big it is and whether it's uh, more or less expensive to use the vectors than to use the scalar code, which is a relatively high level question to ask. We have a very restricted interface that the optimizer uses to do that because the optimizer is somewhat focused on kind of improving your code as opposed to targeting a particular machine. Does that make sense? And, and then later on in the code generator, we do have some elements of an optimizer inside the code generator to, to handle things which are very machine specific, but they tend to be much more isolated, much smaller scale. Uh, this tends to be what deals with the abstractions of the actual C++ code coming in. I want to ask about loop optimization. How, uh, how, sorry, how are you going to optimize loops uh, when you don't know number of iterations? So how do you optimize loops when you don't know the number of iterations? Well, uh, we do it, uh, so I showed in, in this case, we actually just check dynamically the number of iterations that we can expect. And so we can kind of synthesize a hypothetical loop for a particular number of iterations, and then put a predicate in front of it that checks, uh, do we at least have this many iterations? We do? Cool. Then we can use this code that we generated. And we can use all kinds of things to do this. We can kind of guess a number of iterations that we would like to have for a particular vector instruction set. We might have a profile that tells us, by the way, it looks like this loop iterates thousands of times, generate a special version that handles that case. But we just insert dynamic checks when we have to. Um, yeah, you had an example of a wrapper function. Um, yes. Does it just turn out that code size sort of empirically is never a concern in those cases? I, I, I would say that empirically that is the case. We actually, we don't have any special case logic for wrapper functions though, right? Um, what I'm saying is the observation of how the logic that measures kind of code size tends to respond to wrapper functions. The code size impact of one call and the code size impact of another call that have roughly the same number of arguments tends to be roughly the same. That's all. Chandler, thanks very much. Don't miss uh, Chandler's next session. Chandler Carruth. Thank you so much.